Hi friends. I am recording this seventh session of our class on the last days in the study of the of Revelation and the last days events. We're looking at all of the events of, of Revelation, but how they tie into the rest of the scripture as well. So this week we are going to talk about um, Matthew 24 and 25, which are extremely important. And while we look at Matthew 24 and 25, I also want you to pay attention to Mark 13 and Luke 21. These are all, these all, all these scriptures are tied together. So I may not take time to read all of those out loud, but we will read at least Matthew 24 and 25. And I want you to um, remember that all of these are tied together, but they're all tied to the book of Revelation as well. So as I go through, I'll talk to you about what, where we are in Matthew 24 as we move through. All right, let's pray. So Father, right now we just give you glory and praise and honor. We thank you for the days that we live in. We thank you, Lord, that you've chosen us to live in this day and this time. It's perfect. And you knew the perfect time for us to be alive. So Father, we just give you glory for our lives we give you glory for our circumstances, even though we may not like them or we may not understand them all. But Lord, we do say thank you because you are planning our lives. You are letting our lives play out in the way that is the very best plan. You have your eyes upon us. We're so grateful. Now, Lord, as we look at your word, I ask God that you'll teach us your ways. Teach us your understanding. We look at this word and we say... Uh, <laughs> without the Holy Spirit, we have no way of knowing what's going to happen or knowing what you want to, to really convey to us. So we just ask God that you will speak to us as we read your word and as we study your plan for the ages. And we give you all the glory and all the credit, all the power forever and ever, we ask you, Father, to te help us to be teachable. Teach us, Lord, your ways. Teach us your understanding. In Jesus' holy name, we give you praise. Amen. All right, my friends. So let's turn to uh, Matthew chapter 24. And um, I'm not in your notes yet. So we just are in Matthew 24 and Matthew 25. We're going to read together. <clears throat> Verse 1. Then Jesus went out from the temple uh, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. And that did happen. It happened just as Jesus said. Uh, in AD 70, the temple was torn down. The gold from the, um, the decoration around the the temple went down into the walls um, and around the temple walls. And this was Herod's temple. This was the one that Herod built. This was the temple that Herod built. And so literally every stone was torn down out of that temple. And uh, they took, to get the gold out, they took every stone apart. So literally there were no st stones standing. What you see today uh, in Jerusalem is the Temple Mount and that uh, wall that is standing there where they, the, the Jews stand and pray and, and the believers as well, the Christians stand and pray um, is the wall surrounding the Temple Mount. And um, so it's not, it's not the actual temple, that wall, where the, what they call it, the Wailing Wall. It's not the actual temple, but it is where... Um, believers go and I love to go there it's a wonderful place to be and it's just amazing to pray with people um, the Jews and um, and the believers alike are all there all right verse 3 <clears throat> now as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives the disciples came to him privately and said tell us when these things will be and what will be the sign of your coming at the end of this age and so Jesus begins, and this is the beginning of birth pains. Um, so this 
is actually, if we look at our timeline, this is up here is where we're looking at on this particular scripture. Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. But all these are just the beginning of sorrows. And then um, this is when we really start talking about the tribulation. <laughs> then they will deliver you up to tribulation. Remember, it's the tribulation and the great tribulation. So we're in the tribulation and then the great tribulation. They will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. You will be hated for, by all nations for my name's sake. Now remember, he's talking about the, to the disciples. He's talking about the ones who love the Lord. And so in order for us to even begin to talk about the tribulation, we're talking about believers being killed. And I, um, I believe that since the time of Stephen being stoned, um, we have seen great, great uh, persecution on believers, um, but nothing that nothing like what we have seen in the last um, fifty years. Let's say fifty years. Let's stretch it out just a little bit. Um, believers have been uh, persecuted beyond anything we've ever seen in the past. I know about ten years ago they said. Um, and, and then they were talking 20 years ago, they said in the last 10 years, we've had more, uh, believers killed in the last decade than we've had in the entire 2000 years combined. Believers were, are being wiped out in the last five years. We've seen genocides of believers. Look at Syria, look at Iran. Um, look at the nations um, in Africa. Many times we will, we will never hear what is going on. Um, I remember uh, probably six or eight years ago, it's been a while, a man calling into, I was listening to Dennis Prager, who's, which is a secular show, a radio show, talk show, and he talks about um, many different issues, but a man called in and he said, why isn't anybody talking about the genocide going on in the Congo? And I had not heard of it at that time. And I don't know that any of you have heard about it or really listened or paid, you know, heard because it was not on any of our news. But at that time, five million um, Congolese believers had been killed, mercilessly slaughtered. And um, the, they were believers. Same thing when, when it happened, began in Syria um, about five years ago, maybe a little more. Uh, they, the number of Christians in that nation was pretty good size. And they slaughtered all of them. And the ones that weren't slaughtered were sent, were off to camps. So there's been massive amounts. And those are just, that's just the ones we know of. We don't, we don't really have a clue how many have been killed. But I just want to remind you of these things because we can look at this and say, oh, well, there's not been a, you know, a lot of death. There's been a lot of death and persecution of believers. And this is before the tribulation. So the difficulty for the saints has really been since the, uh, since the stoning of Stephen. I do believe that many believers have been uh, persecuted and many people groups um, that love the Lord have been persecuted. Many Jews, obviously we know about the Jews and the, per the Jewish persecutions that have gone on. If you're, if you are at all adhering to the word of God, you're going to see persecution. And, um, but this talks about that even more so. <clears throat> and then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Verse 10. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, 
and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this is the part where we begin to talk about the great tribulation now, verse 14. So we move to this now. <laughs> and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, remember it's spoken of right here at the, seven, at the seven, three and a half year mark, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads this, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who <clears throat> is on the housetop not go down and take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray your, that your flight may not be in winter or in the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, they will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive. And we're talking about the Antichrist there, but I believe there's going to be many, um, even smaller Antichrists, uh, those who are doing uh, wickedly. Because remember, sorcery is one of the great sins that nobody is, or that they are not repenting for. If possible, they would, <clears throat> excuse me, false cross and Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Now, remember, this is Jesus talking, so he's talking about what's happened. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms. Do not believe it. And then we will see the second coming. For as the lightning comes, verse 27, from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. I, I just want you to pay attention to how Jesus himself uses this terminology. Um, he uses the word tribulation. <clears throat> well, obviously, it's, it's our, the Greek word, but um, <clears throat> this is what he's using to describe what's happening in this day. And I also, <clears throat> excuse me, I also want to say that many times when we're reading scripture, we're reading through verses and great chunks of time are going by um, in the chronology. But actually, so we want to, that's why I'm actually reading quite slow, because I want us to actually take in what he's saying. The chronology is there. Jesus uses, uses excellent chronology, of course. And <clears throat> he is giving us the example of what is going to be happen, happening over time. He's not saying it's going to happen on one day, but he's giving us the timeline, Okay. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. I want you to remember where we read this in, your, in, the, in the book of Revelation. And you can tie this into that scripture and um, um, put yourself in the timeline of Revelation. And I believe it is around... Uh, 12, 13, 14, right in there where it talks about the sun and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the son of man will appear in heaven. Then all of the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. Remember, we talked about the seven trumpets. So we're at the, uh, 
the seventh trumpet right here, and they will sound the great sound of the trumpet and will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. <clears throat> now, Jesus in his great literary genius then stops and he gives you a parable. He stops and tells us a story. He says, now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. You also know when you see these things, you know that this is near at, and at the door. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means, and he's talking about that generation, this generation, when they begin to see this season happen with the fig tree, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So as we're looking at this, um, it's been very easy for people to take this out of context and use this on its own. But I'm just reading you the whole sermon at once. And when Jesus says, when you see this begin to happen, remember, this generation will not pass away because they're going to see everything happen. Okay? And we're supposed to know these things. We're supposed to, we're supposed to know. We are commanded to recognize the signs of the times. And then he gives an illustration. He stops at verse 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven. But my Father only knows. But as in the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them away. So also will be the Son of Man, will the coming of the Son of Man be. Verse 40. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the meal. One will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. I do believe that um, as the tribulation grows um, further and further in, that we will be doing the same things we're always doing. It's very interesting that this shutdown has shut down marriages. And um, I do know of a couple of weddings that have happened anyway. But obviously they couldn't have a lot of people shut down funerals. Um, just heard of one this morning that they're not going to celebrate until July. But people will continue be continuing to doing things that they've always been doing. Marrying, get, having funerals, going to parties enjoying life. We will be doing things like normal. We will, we will keep life going. Life will keep going just like we do. It won't be different. Um, I, I know that there will be world events that are shaking just like what we're watching right now. But the thing that the Lord is reminding of us, us of here is that even though everything is going on, watch because I'm coming. Now you're going to know this season. You're going to know this timing. The fig tree is getting is beginning to turn and uh, know that you are in the season where the Lord is going to come after the tribulation of these days. Now, he says we don't know the hour. We don't know the hour that he's going to come. But we are going to know the season. And we are commanded to know the season. All right. And, okay, let me say this also. Um, there will be that time where, and they're already saying this, oh, he's not coming. There is no rapture. It's not going to happen. So if we're hearing that now, how much more so will we hear that in the days to come? Um, I believe that as the days go forward, we are going to hear this more and more. Who is, you know, where, where is this Jesus? I thought he was coming before things got rough. 
I thought he I thought it was this I thought it was that so what's what's going on here this isn't what I signed up for I'm not going to I'm not I'm not staying for this you know this ball game uh, I've watched uh, I've also heard of um, several suicides during this time people just completely giving up being isolated and being, um, it has given them a place of no hope. And I, I, um, I just watch this and I think, what are we headed to? Because if people are, um, not in hope now, what is it going to be as the days grow darker? We must encourage each other with these things. We must continue to meet. I was listening to Hebrews this morning and listening to talk about don't forsake the gathering together. Um, it's very interesting that our churches, churches are closed right now, but we're not going to stop meeting together. Um, uh, if you need to meet with somebody and pray, get a hold of me. <laughs> but we are not going to forsake the, the gathering together. All right, now, this, um, the next verse is in 45, uh, Matthew 45, uh, 25, verse 45, and this is also in, uh, this story is also in uh, Luke 41, or excuse me, Luke 12, 41 through 48, so I'll read this thing out too. I love that Jesus just loves to tell stories. And he does this so that we'll say, oh, this is what that is. He's so good to give us the story um, of what's happening and the parable. So, and this is an exhortation uh, that we are to watch and pray and not be weighted down. Here we go. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give him food in due season? Blessed is the, the servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming, he's not coming yet, and begins to, to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour when he is not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So it's such a serious warning for us to watch and to pray and an ex exhortation for us to strengthen one another during this time and to, and to not um, grow weary in doing the right, doing what the Lord has called us to do. It's so serious, all right? Now we go to the, the parable of the 10 virgins. Verse 25. Oh, let me, let me just say this before I leave the um, faithful. Let's see, the two servants, the faithful servant and the, the um, wise servant. Uh, there's two types of Christian leaders, and we must be diligent in the face of pressure and disappointment. Uh, it's just not going to all look good for us. But we have to be the ones who will say, I'm going on anyway. I'm going forward. Come with me. Come with me. That's what a good leader does. A good leader says, let's go together. Let's work on, let's work on the, our, uh, our salvation together with fear and trembling. Let's search out the things of the Lord together. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> then the second parable this parable is the warning to us to stay close to the Lord, to stay close, to stay closer, to actually cultivate 
a love of the Lord and a love of the things of the Lord even more so as things have. And I've, I've been very thankful to hear of other people um, who have said, this shutdown has been wonderful because I've been able to spend so much time in prayer. I feel the same. Um, it's been an amazing time. I felt like there was three, there were three or four or five weeks in there where I felt like I went from prayer meeting to prayer meeting on the phone, on the phone, on the internet. <laughs> it was prayer meeting to prayer meeting. To prayer. It was powerful. And um, I actually began to see more healings take place because I felt like we were in such a place of intimacy with the Lord. And so I still feel like that. I still feel like things are moving forward and, and um, that the Lord is uh, just bringing us into a place of uh, just precious intimacy with him, just close to the Lord. And we're not, it doesn't seem like we're doing anything necessarily other than we're just being in the presence. And that's, there it is. There it is. That's where everything is, is right there in the presence. All right, so, and that is why we have the parable of the ten virgins. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. And those virgins arose, trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are, are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in to him, to the wedding, and the door was shut. Now, let me just say, we know there's going to be a rapture, and we know there's going to be the marriage supper of the Lamb, and we'll read that in Revelation. Could this be referring to that? Uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb is only mentioned one time, and... Um, we don't have a whole lot of clues for this. So you can't build a, a doctrine around one scripture. But could it be referring to this? That the believers who aren't ready um, aren't maybe aren't changed at that time. I don't know. I don't know. But could it be that um, they go in to the marriage supper of the Lamb? Or could it be that they just miss the marriage supper of the Lamb because they're not ready? They haven't. They haven't trimmed their lamps. They haven't stayed close to the Lord. They haven't been watching for him day and night. Something to think about. <laughs> let's remember, let's let the word of God convince our hearts of where we are in scripture and of his time period and of who he is. All right. Afterward, verse 11, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and he said, Assuredly, I say, I don't know you. Watch therefore, for you know whether the, you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Now the day nor the hour is, is kind of a small time period, right? He doesn't say we won't know the generation. I believe we will know the generation. He doesn't say we won't know the season. We will know the season. We may not know the day or the hour, but we're going to know the season. And we are to be watching and we're to be ready and we're to be um, paying attention. And when they're denying the Lord all around us, we are the ones that better be saying, I'm, re I'm still waiting. I'm waiting for my bridegroom to arrive. All right. <clears throat> And now we have another parable. <laughs> if you think for one second that Jesus doesn't love to tell stories, you're, you've missed a good chunk of the Gospels. <laughs> Read again. All right. All right. Um, yeah, one of the notes, uh, one of the things in my notes was um, the oil can represent being in ministry 
without the anointing, without the anointing of the Holy Spirit to move forward. It's extremely important. There's, um, in our day and age right now, there's not enough willpower to stay in ministry if you don't have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It becomes a job. It becomes something that it should not be. So if there's any type of ministry, whether you're an evangelist, whether you're a preacher, teacher, speaker, whatever, uh, whether you're hospi you know, hospitality, whatever it is, be seeking the presence of the Lord. Whether you're ministering to those who are sick, you're a doctor, a nurse, a you know, whatever, whatever kind of uh, job you have. If you're the mother, you're at home, and you're raising your children. You have to have the presence of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord in, in you to give you encouragement, to strengthen you. So we can't have intimacy. We, can't, we don't have enough oil in our lamps without um, asking the Lord and, and getting into that place of intimacy. And the Lord's warning us not to think we can do it without that. Don't just think you can go on because you're going to become hardened. You're going to become um, angry, bitter, all of those things. So don't think that you can do it without the oil of the Holy Spirit, without the burning fire of Jesus in your heart. It's very easy for us to deny that we need that. But it's, it's, this is a strong warning from for, the, for this uh, ten virgins all right <clears throat> all right now we want to go to verse 31 boy parable of the talents wait a second verse 14 for the kingdom of heaven sorry matthew 25 14 for the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, and to another two, to another one he gave according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. This is kind of like Jesus giving us something, a talent, and what are we going to do? And then Jesus goes away. Okay? Then he... Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, the two who had received two gained two more also. So in other words, they doubled their, their talents. They doubled their, and that can be your, um, the gifts that the Holy Spirit has given you. It can be your, it can be financial, it can be provision, but it shows that there's increase when we ask the Lord to help us and that we work and we move forward in our giftings and in our what we have, what we have in our hands to use for the Lord. He who received one went out and dug in the ground and hid the Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled their accounts, kind of like what it is when Jesus will return. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you would be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. I want you to think about somebody saying this to God. I knew you would be hard on me, God. I knew you would Reap where you have not sown. And he actually did give this man something. Isn't that interesting? What a, what a harsh judgment against his master. But I was afraid. What did the Lord say to us? 
do not fear. Do not fear, because this is exactly what happens. If we are afraid, we hide what the Lord has given us. And we, oh, I can't move forward. I can't do anything. And the fear comes in, and we just become trapped in that fear. I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent. He knew whose talent it was in the ground. Look, there. What you have is yours. It's yours. Here, take it back. <laughs> What a snot. And the Lord answered him that thus. <laughs> but his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers and at my coming I would have received back mine own with interest. So take the talent from him, give it, give it to him who has ten talents, for to everyone who has more will, will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has, has will be taken away. Even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What an interesting picture of the last day's judgment. Very interesting. And that is, we're talking about here. Here. Clear at the end. We're talking about, it's very interesting that the Lord just goes right through. Um, very interesting. So when the Son of Man comes... Verse 31, in his glory and, and all the holy angels. Now, what does that sound like? That's the, the um, rapture. When, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him and he will sit on the throne of his glory, all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one for another as he divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire prepared, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and you, in prison, you did not visit me. Then also, they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, thirsty, or naked, or sick in prison? When did we did, and we did not minister to you. Then he will answer, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment and the righteous to eternal life. So I wanted to read 24, or yeah, 24 and 25, just to show you the chronology of those two chapters. Um, several years ago when I was reading through it, I was actually stunned because I just had not realized the chronology that Jesus uses and Jesus taught from. And um, I've had several questions about the different parables, the fig tree, the virgins, and all of those. And so I wanted to go ahead and bring them into context and bring them into the timeline so that we see where they are and how Jesus uses the word tribulation great tribulation, the coming of the Son of Man. He, he gives you the, the, straight the straight timeline, and it's quite 
stunning how um, how brilliant it is and how um, how easily understood it is when we do it in context and we don't take it take it apart piece by piece. So let's now turn to our um, notebook and I want you to turn to page 49 in your notes um, and the notes that I sent out. <clears throat> and this this is, I'm skipping a chapter in there. Um, in the, if you have the book, I skipped a chapter. So I just want you to know it's this, the, the heading is the importance of standing with Israel. So in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, the Apostle John sees a particular, com a peculiar, a particular couple, uh, company of people. John is describing the future end time mar martyrs. And this is from Revelation 20. Then I saw thrones and sitting on them were those who, ha who had authority to act as judges and to pass sentence was entrusted. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been slain with axes, beheaded. Remember, we talked, we've talked about this um, because right now we know there's Islam. Their favorite way of killing is, is beheading. Um, for their witness to Jesus and for preaching and testifying for the word of God and who had refused to pay homage to the beast or the, his statue and had not accepted his mark or permitted it to be stamped on their foreheads or hands. And they lived again and ruled with Christ a thousand years. Here's what John 16 says. I have told you these things so that you would not be offended. Um, remember in Matthew, even we were talking about people being offended at God's plan, offended that God didn't do it the way they wanted him to, or offended the way, you know, they were on their soapbox and they said it needs to be, it's going to be this way. And they're offended that um, it's not how they thought it was going to be. And the Lord is like, don't be offended. Don't be, don't be, tur don't turn away. This is where we are. We're, um, uh, this generation will not die. This is not the time to be offended. Um, I, you know, if the Lord says not to be offended, then there's going to be a reason for us to be offended. Um, I have learned that when he warns you of something that's going to happen in your own life, and I'm just going to give you an example. Um, I was in Nepal and, um, I woke up one morning to a, a dream and it's kind of gross. So I'm going to, but I'm going to tell you the dream. Um, we were in a place, um, it, it, everything's open air and there is no heat <laughs> In, if you can imagine being in the high Himalayas in Nepal and there's no heat in those buildings, um, it is freezing cold. Um, you guys, you, we here in Colorado know what, what it is like up in the mountains. So we had to carry uh, sleeping bags uh, that would keep us warm to 60 <laughs> degrees below zero. So, um, one morning I woke up with a dream. I, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about Nepal. We were in this place. I'll never forget where we were because it was like being in a, in gun smoke. It, it was like that kind of a building. It was those boards and you could see through the boards in the hotel we were in <laughs> and it was these, uh, it looked like straight out of gun smoke. That time period, it just looked like, you know, they put these boards down. You could see through the floors. <laughs> you could see through the walls. The door, the door in my room opened up. If you would have walked through the door, you would have fallen two floors, <laughs> two, two stories to the ground and died. <laughs> so the door was locked, but it was still, you could have walked out of it. <laughs> it was freezing cold. I would, uh, while I was there, I, I fig finally figured out because I could not figure out how to take uh, bucket baths. We did, you, when you're in other countries, most of the time you do bucket baths. They have no issue not having toilet paper. You just, you, you just wash off in their bathrooms because they always have a bucket. But you also take your showers that way. You take a bucket and you just wash off with the, with the cup. Well, um, I was so cold the entire time, I could not figure out how to take a shower. <laughs> and um, 
uh, I took as few showers as I possibly could, but finally I figured out how to do it. So if you ever go to Nepal, you'll know. <laughs> um, and we were, and we were the sa up uh, the same, um, not as high as Everest. We, we were down in the, but we were still in the high Himalayas and we were in that region of, of, uh, Mount Everest. Most of those mountains are so high that they're in the clouds all the time and you don't see them. It doesn't clear. Um, which I didn't know. Uh, we did get to see some mountains, but only some one day we would see one of the highest, you know, mountains. Just to give you an idea, our mountains here in Colorado are 17,000 feet, and in the high Himalayas, they're 20, um, double that, 32. So <clears throat> that's how high they are. It's, it is, when we were flying in, we were, I was looking down saying, that can't be the, that can't be the mountains. It was the mountains. They're so high. Anyway, that gives you just a little bit of perspective because we understand the high altitudes and the high mountains here in Colorado. So <laughs> thought that would that's a good little geography lesson. Anyway, <clears throat> wow. So <clears throat> freezing cold. I learned that if I would get in my sleeping bag with my clothes on and and get as warm as I could about. Th two or three in the morning, I would wake up and, um, and be hot because you, you cover up so well. Well, when I would get that hot, when I generate a lot of heat, I'd wake up about three and I'd be hot. And so I would get up and I would go to the bathroom. And, and the other thing is too, nobody else was up. Thank God, because you're sharing <laughs> the whole hotel is sharing one or two bathrooms. So, anyway, so I got up and and I would go take my shower then and it was ice cold water. I would get my shower taken and I would run back into bed, get back in my sleeping bag <laughs> and then hope by morning I would be back to thawed, <laughs> thawed stage. Um, and so, but when, after I went back to sleep one night, after I'd gotten up at three and, and then gone, gotten back into my warm sleeping bag, um, I had a dream and it was very interesting because in the place where I was, I dreamed that I was in a, there was a tent like Pers a Persian tent, you know, you think of the harem tents, you think of these beautiful tents where they have all of these beautiful garments laying around, these amazing tapestries and all of that, and you see a lot of that in India and Nepal. It's beautiful. Anyway, there was a man that walked in through this beautiful white tent, and he is leading a cat behind him, and the cat is not a normal cat. The cat, oh, and okay, the guy looked like a prince or a ruler of some sort. He was dressed to the hilt. He's dressed white, top to bottom. He has a turban on that's just full of beautiful stones and everything else. So he looks like some type of ruler. And uh, it made me wonder if he was some type of a stronghold in that area principality and power. That's what I was thinking. I was like, hmm. Anyway, so uh, this man, he walks in and he's leading a cat behind him. Now this cat was absolutely regal and it's walking very seductively and very, um, it had a lot of expression, like it was, it was almost human in expression, but it was a cat. And it's pretty, it's a, it's a large cat, but it's not like a mountain lion. It's not that big. It's smaller and, or a bobcat, you know, it's smaller, but it, but it was good size and it was strong and it's dressed it, the cat itself is beautiful colors. It's not just white, it's pink and it's got other colors in it. A lot of pastel -y colors all through it. It's very beautiful. And, but it was walking very seductively, like, you know, almost like a female seductively. And, um, and as I'm watching the cat, I um, see its, its bottom 
And that is highlighted to me in the dream. And I woke up and I thought, oh, that's gross. Why did you, you know, Lord, <laughs> what are you doing? That's what I do. You see, when there's those dreams, you don't really want to see that. You know, I was like, oh, I didn't want to see that. But when I woke up and then I start thinking, oh my goodness, that's offense. That's the spirit of offense right there. That's what it looks like. It's very seductive. It makes you, it makes you think, oh, yeah, I can, I could participate with that or something in that, along that vein. So for the rest of that trip, I, and actually for the rest of that year and the next, I, it, it heightened what, what that dream did was heightened my, re, my understanding that the Lord was going to allow offense, or there was going to be offense, and he was warning me of it, <clears throat> number one, warning me that offense was going to be coming my way and that I needed to be very careful. And so, and he was, of course, the Lord was exactly right. That was what was happening. And I could have, I could have even justified myself and, and participated in that offense or be, and been offended and been taken aback by it. But instead, the Lord... <clears throat> was warning me so that I would not get offended and I would not be offended and I would not participate in that offense in, in an offense in any way shape or form so I was so careful from then on it was really good because everything that would happen I would go mm. <laughs> is this that and I felt I actually felt like the Lord was really just heightening my watch, uh, watch of my own heart, watch of my, um, attitude, my mouth, my every, all of my senses, Lord, keep me from offense. So my prayer <clears throat> went up into no, he keep me from offense, Lord, keep me from offense. And, uh, I know he protected me several times. There were several offenses right off the bat that I could have gotten fit, you know, I could have gotten involved in and I didn't. And it was so good. And every and still to this day, every offense that goes past me, I'm like, Lord, thank you. Thank you for keeping me from offense. I'm not saying I operated in everything perfectly since then, but uh, <clears throat> boy, I apologize. I think the allergies are getting to me. Anyway, the um, watching the offense is around me and the things happened where I, you know, I would quickly say, I'm not going to get involved, you know, to myself. I'm not going to get involved in this and uh, pray for myself. Lord, keep me even during this virus going into different stores and things and thinking, Lord, keep me from being offended at other people. Help me to have a good word to say to people. Help me not to participate in their offenses. Help me not to be offended. So I... It's interesting that the Lord warns uh, so many times about offense. And um, I'm, for a long time, my goal has been that I will not be offended and I will not participate with offense. It's such a serious deal because it can drag you down into a hole that then the offense will allow a bitter root of judgment. It will make a judgment. Well, that person did that because they are this and that and the other. You make a judgment against them. Then, when we do that, a bitter root of judgment lands and it makes us judge them harshly. And, and guess what? We actually are participating then full bore with an offense. That offense then can plant a bitter root in our hearts. And we call it a bitter root of judgment because that we've made that judgment. It sticks down in our heart. And I tell you what, those are the things that make us sick. Those are the things that make us, um, um, even, can, even disease can land in those kinds of offenses. We don't want to be offended or people that are walking in offense or people that are quick to participate with other people's offenses. Don't do it. If, if you feel like you're making a judgment about somebody, get out of that and say, Lord, I repent. I don't want to. And if you need to apologize to them, apologize to them. And, um, so, and even as we're talking right now, I'm even thinking of a situation that I probably need to say, Hey, I want to make sure that there's nothing between us, between you and me. I want to make sure that I repent if there's anything I need to repent for. So it's important and so much more so because the Lord just warned us of this during this time. He said, there's going to be many offenses. Don't, 
Don't get involved in it. Don't be offended by how they treat you. Because guess what? When you're being persecuted, you're not being treated nicely. You could get offended. And then you bear all of the problems of that of offense. Look at what the disciples suffered. Look at what people have suffered down through time. And do we think we'll escape it? And that we'll not have to deal with these kinds of things? You know, we're in America and we think, you're not going to treat me like that. I've been very much vocal about some of the, I'm not going to wear a mask. <laughs> it's very easy for us to get like that, but I'm not going to be offended about it. I've worn my, I've worn a mask in the stores because the stores are trying to comply with the government and it's our, our governor, our cities who are taking power that they don't have and they are putting that on the people. And we need to put we need to put pressure on the right people, not on our in our grocery stores. You're not we don't need to be yelling at our people who are trying to get our groceries. You know, they're just trying to do their job and not get fired and they have to comply. The businesses to keep their licenses are having to comply. We need to put pressure on the government that is trying to take rights away. Um, it's not it's it's not the people that are right in front of us so much of the time. So we want to be very careful. All right. So don't be offended, but take take your rightful authority and um, and deal with the situation rightly instead of being offended and mad at something that you, that this person in front of us can't fix or change. But we can go to the right rightful authorities that can change things. Boy, that turned into something, didn't it? <laughs> But I think it's extremely important that we do not, we learn now not to participate with offense and not be offensive. Let's not be offensive to other people who are trying to, I feel like our, I feel like many of our, because I've been out so much in grocery stores and everything else during this time. I feel like so many of the, of the grocery store clerks have been traumatized and I'm sure it's by people who are just angry because their rights are being taken away. And sometimes it's misplaced anger. Sometimes it's they're angry at everybody around them. They're like, you know, don't tell me what to do, whatever. And I've watched several things. And it's just like I have to protect my heart and say, do not be offended, Steph. Don't be offended. But take it to the right, rightful authorities. I wrote to the governor this morning and said, do not, please do not put all of these regulations on restaurants who are trying to make it to trying to survive all right um <clears throat> okay so let's keep going so okay the other thing is right here we're talking about israel and the reason that we have to pay attention to israel is because many people are offended by israel and if and we as believers Need to be need to be very cognizant that we have to be the ones who stand with the people of Israel and with um, uh, because the persecution is going to come down hard on them. We know it is because the Word of God says it is, and if it's going to come down on the believers, it's going to come down on on the Jews as well. And so we all have got to stand together. Okay. All right. Here's what the scripture says in John 16, on, and I'm still on the first page. It says, I have told you all these things that you will not be offended, taken unaware, and falter, or caused to be stumbled and fall away. This is from the Amplified Version. They will put you out of and expel you from the synagogues. But the hour is coming whenever whoever kills you will think and claim that he has offered his service to God. Notice that is, is now I don't want to blame all Islamics, as you know, but the Muslim thing is to kill believers, kill the infidel, and yell, Allah is great. Well, they think that they are serving God as they kill. Now, that's not true of any other religion, just this, just this one. They will do this because they have not known the Father or me. But I have told you these things now so that when they occur, you will remember that I told you of them. 
I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. He said, I'm with you now, but just know that these things will happen. So this is what end time persecution is going to look like. It's going to be global. They will believe they're carrying out a divinely appointed role. Beheading is their chosen form of execution. And we want to understand the battle of Jerusalem. That is the most significant battle front in the spirit today. It is central to the Armageddon campaign and Jesus' second coming to reign as king of the whole earth. Gentile believers have a significant role in this battle. Therefore, the church, we have got to understand this. Um, I put in here um, several stories of how Israel became a nation again. I'm going to leave this for you to read. These are exciting to read. They are fun. I took them. I gave credit to Perry Stone because I got them out of his, uh, one of his books. And uh, they're funny. Some of them are funny. So I want you to read those on your own. I won't take time to read them onto the, um, the uh, video. But then I'm gonna, I want you to come down to page 53. And there's a heading that says today. It's a big heading that says today. And I, I pray that I'm correct on the page number, but it's right around verse 53. I skipped several pages there. Today in Israel, resurgence in the number of Jews who believe in Jesus is getting a lot of attention. Many leaders say it's the strongest growth um, in believers in Jesus since the time of Jesus and that the Messianic movement could be on the brink of a great revival. Praise the Lord. Um, this is what CBN says. This is the first time where we've seen Israeli society in general being so open to consider who Yeshua is, said Messianic leader Asher and Trader. This is a real miracle, and there's the beginning, and there's beginning to be grace and favor with us in the land, CBN. Now, since he said that, I've seen several things where they've been persecuted by the extreme religious Jews, the Hasidim, the, the ones who are Orthodox, there's still major persecution, and, and every once in a while, it just ramps up. That persecution of the Messianic believer ramps up. In fact, just recently, they have they have a lot of the they have control. The very extreme religious Jews have control over so many governmental aspects. Like they have uh, almost full control, as from what I understand, of the airports and who comes in integration and all of that kind of thing and um that's why they made it so difficult to get into israel if you uh used to be we could go in for up to three months believers we could go in or anybody we could go in as tourists or go in for a school and um go in for three months at a time and then come out and then go back um, come out for three months and go back or come out for six weeks i can't remember what the numbers were but now it's changed. Um, you can come in for three months, but then you have to go out for six months. That makes it way more difficult for people to stay um, over in another country. Um, and then they can only come back in for three months again. So it's they have made it much more difficult for people to get in right now. And that's that's more of a, a, um, a newer uh, thing in the last couple of years this has happened. And right now I'm recording this in 2020. Um, the Armageddon campaign, the final war that Jesus, uh, when he returns, remember last week we talked about the rapture happening. We're all with him. When he returns, he's going. They're going. He's going to be drawing all nations to to Megiddo, the the uh, the valley. Uh, down in, um, in uh, north, excuse me, up in northern Israel, and they will, and that valley right there is called <clears throat> Armageddon. Now the word for it is Armageddon. It's Megiddo, the Megiddo, the valley that you look out over when you're standing up where uh, Elijah saw the prophet. Uh, Elijah confronted the prophets of Baal. And it's right there, and God is going to again, in a greater way, confront the prophets of Baal. The, the Babylonian leaders from the entire world are going to come to that nation. And God is going to be calling them, but also the devil, the enemy of our soul, Satan himself, is going to be calling all of the nations to come and war against God. 
because he's stupid and he thinks he's going to win. I he, honestly, anyway, okay. <laughs> so this battle, this battle, and, and I'm sure some battles are going to be taking place during this final three and a half years, but there's going to be a final battle. And that is what's going to be taking place during this 30 days. But God is going to pour out his bowls of wrath upon the nation, upon the, um, the, the nations that come against him then. Um, <clears throat> this lasts for three and a half years during the Great Tribulation and ends with the Battle of Jerusalem. Why? Whichever man, Jesus or Antichrist, wins this war will be worshipped and will rule the whole earth from Jerusalem. After Jesus wins this war and is received by Israel in Jerusalem as their king, then Satan will be cast into prison. So he knows his time is short. The Antichrist and the false prophet will be thrown into the lake of fire. Remember, it's the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the uh, idol, the, the, the uh, triune, the evil, wicked triune. Uh, trinity um, of the Antichrist, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the idol. But the, they will be thrown into the lake of fire. Um, Jesus will not rule Jerusalem until he is officially invited. Okay, I do have a scripture here that I would probably need to go ahead and read. So it's Revelation 19.11. Now I saw heaven opened and beheld held a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many crowns. Um, he had a name no one knew of but himself. Okay, I'm going to read forward because we read this last week. Then to let's go to 17. Then I saw an angel standing on the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather for the supper of the great God, that you may eat of the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked uh, signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. That was Jesus. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil, Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. Boy, ha, ah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. Jesus will not rule in Jerusalem until he's officially invited by the Jewish leaders. This is in your notes to be their king. As the leaders in position to be heirs of Abraham's covenant, they act as the official representatives of the nation's covenant with God. Adam was in position legally. So I want you to think back to the very beginning. Adam was in position legally to give his authority to Satan in a similar way. These leaders will legally give the authority of the nation to Jesus at the end of the tribulation. Jesus bound himself by his own prophecy to only come back to Jerusalem after Israel's leadership invites him to reign over them. Jesus refuses to force himself on them as their king. They, Israel, must be willing. Satan seeks to exploit this prophecy as a loophole in God's prophetic plan by controlling Jerusalem and seeing to it that no Jews are alive to invite Jesus back to be king over. Satan wants to demonstrate that Jesus' prophetic word is false. If Jesus' prophecy is shown forth as a lie, then Jesus could not judge Satan as a liar. Therefore, Satan's strategy is to kill the entire Jewish race. Here's what he said in Matthew 23. Now remember, Matthew 23 is just before what we just read in Matthew 24. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I wanted to gather you, your children together, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I say to you, 
you will see me no more until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It just strikes me how the Lord loves them so. And he will not over, override their free will. <clears throat> we just pray for Israel right now and we bless them. We bless our country as well because we talked about USA being right in the middle of the word Jerusalem. J, you can't spell Jerusalem without seeing USA right in the middle of that. Because I believe we're tied together. The devil said to him, Jesus, all this authority. Now this is in uh, Luke 4. All this authority. The enemy is such a, what a snot. All this authority I will give you, for this has been delivered to me by Adam. And I will give it to whoever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. Jesus answered and said, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only will you serve. And he will one day. He will have to bow. <clears throat> one day I was memorizing scripture with my son, Caleb, and we were sitting reading Isaiah 53. And it talks in there about how um, Jesus is saying, you cut me off from the land of the living. And we're reading that scripture and we're memorizing it over and over. And all of a sudden I realized, what's the land of the living? And so I began to go through scripture. And I thought, Jesus only wanted to be with us forever. He always wanted to be here on this land, the land of the living. Nowhere in the Bible, I did the whole study of what's, what is the land of the living because I hadn't thought of it. And I went through the whole scripture and the land of the living is here, is us. It's Jesus, heaven is never called the land of the living, even though it's alive, <laughs> very much so. But the earth is the land of the living. And God, God wanted to be here. He wanted to come here and live. And stay and be on this earth for 33 years. He wanted to stay when Adam, when he was walking with Adam. He wanted to be here. He loves this land. He loves what he created. And he wants to be here with us. So that is what we look forward to in the millennial reign, which we're going to do next week. <clears throat> it's such a good, good lesson on what's going to be happening. But I want you to think about what Adam gave up. He gave over the land of the living to the enemy. And the enemy sits there like a, like a pompous creep. I'm sorry, I was about to cuss. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but he is, he is. He's pompous and proud and ridiculous. And he says, hey, I'll give you all this authority, Jesus, if you'll just bow down to me. What? A, what? Honestly. So Jesus spoke another parable. This is Luke 19. Because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman. This is so powerful. This is so powerful. Jesus went to a far country, heaven, to receive for himself a kingdom. And to return to Jerusalem at the second coming. But the citizens of earth hated him. And he sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man rule over us. So it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he said, bring here those enemies who did not want me to reign over them and slay them. This will happen one day, my friends. It's been happening since Cain. Cain said, I don't need, we're going to break off the chains. We're going to break off the law break off the the uh, constraints that heaven has given us we don't want that psalm 2 is is the scripture that goes along with that god will deal with it one day god raised christ from the dead and exalted him to the place of the highest honor and supreme authority in the heavenly realm 
And now he is exalted as first above every ruler, authority, government, and realm of power in existence. He is gloriously enthroned over every name that has ever praised. Whoops, has ever praised. And not only in this age, but in the age to come. And he alone is the leader and the source of everything needed in the church. God has put everything beneath the authority of Jesus Christ and has given him the highest rank above all others. That's Ephesians 1, 20 and 22. Israel will make a fit, an official covenant with the Antichrist at the beginning of the tribulation. Right here. When we see that happen, boy, my friends, here we go. Jesus will wait until they reverse this decision at the end of the tribulation and they, uh, by asking him to rule over them. Let's look together at Isaiah 28, 14. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scornful men who rule this people who are in Jerusalem. Because you have said we have made a covenant with death and with Sheol, and we are in agreement. When the overflowing scourge passes through, it will not come to us, for we have made our lies our refuge. And under falsehood, we have hidden ourselves. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Sorry. Whoever believes will not act hastily. Also, I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plummet. The hail will sweep away the refuge of lies. And the waters will overflow the hiding place. Your covenant with death will be annulled. What a merciful God. And your agreement with Sheol will not stand. When the overflowing scourge passes through, then you will be trampled down by it. And now let's turn to uh, John. Look, Luke, John. John the Revelator wrote, some of the most amazing books in the Bible. Uh, his books alone are worth, <laughs> worth reading through. If you don't read the whole thing through every year, just read his. I have come in my Father's name, and you did not receive me. This is Jesus speaking. Um, I actually would love to back up in that just a little bit, but it says, I have come in my Father's name. And you did not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. Jesus is talking there of the Antichrist because he says, you know what? I came in my name. I told you who I was and you did not receive me. But there will be another who will come. And you will receive him. Oh. All right. At the end of the seven-year period, Israel will reverse this official decision by asking Jesus to be their king who rules over them. Praise the Lord. <laughs> we know that these things have to come to pass. Jesus will be established as king over Jerusalem and Israel by the covenant invitation of the official political leaders of the nation after he will branch out as his government replaces evil governments of the nations. In other words, from Jerusalem, he will take over the government of every nation. Satan does not want this to happen. <laughs> Nor does the deep state. <laughs> Jeremiah 3.17 says, Oh, I should read. Let's go to Isaiah, back to Isaiah. Because Isaiah 2, 1 through 4. So good. I know I skip over some scriptures, but please go back and read them. <laughs> They're so, I, the word is so good. Okay. The word of Isaiah. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days 
that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established <laughs> on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. This is exciting because this means you and me. Many people shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and he will walk in and we shall walk in his paths for out of Zion shall go forth the law. Now you can, you can put right beside that word law, Torah, which was the scriptures, the first five books of the Bible, because those are the things that the Lord established first. That's what Jesus taught out of. And that's what Isaiah would have been teaching out of. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, he shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation neither shall they learn war anymore we're back here we're back here in a thousand years glory <laughs> all right now and then my and uh, micah also quotes this again jeremiah 3 17 isaiah jeremiah 3 at that time, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered to it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. No more shall they flow or follow the dictates of their evil hearts. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Thus says the Lord of hosts in Zechariah 6 in your notes. Behold the man Jesus, whose name is the branch. From this place he shall branch out, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory. He shall sit and rule on his throne. So he shall be the priest on his throne. Satan's rage against Jerusalem and Israel. John uses a prophetic picture of Israel as a woman being attacked by Satan, pictured as a dragon. Now, this scripture has... Um, I, the way I have it broken down, in, or way that it's broken down here, it's Revelation 12. And I actually recommend you write this in your Bible this way because it's in such a allegorical term. Not It's not allegory, but it's um, in, you have to go back and define it with all of those words that we have in the very beginning of the, of the study. And so I have it written out in the with the definitions right there, so that you're going to know the language of of is of uh, excuse me Revelation and Daniel are the what defines the terminology in this scripture. So this is <clears throat> Revelation twelve thirteen through seventeen. When the dragon, who is Satan, remember, saw that he had been cast to earth, he persecuted the woman, which is the remnant of Israel who gave birth to the male child, who is Jesus. The woman escaped into the wilderness from the presence of the certain serpent, who is Satan. So the serpent spewed water like a flood after the woman, um, the remnant of Israel, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood of persecution. The dragon was enraged with the woman. I tell you, we are going to see rage come against Israel like we've never seen. God help us. And we have to stand with Israel. He went to make war with the rest of her offspring, which is us, the believing church, who have the testimony of Jesus. So we must stand with Israel in these days. Even if they don't know Jesus yet, we must stand with them because it is, it is key to what is going to happen next. Israel's condition just before Jesus' coming is described in scriptures as being in prison camps and held captive and assaulted by foreign armies. When Jesus returns, hostile anti-Semitic nations will have once again imprisoned and taken Jewish people captive, even scattering them uh, across the nations. Zechariah prophesied that half the city of Jerusalem would be taken into captivity. Staggering. 600, about 600,000 Jews currently live in Jerusalem, 8.5 million in Israel. Half of the city of Jerusalem could mean as many as 300,000 Jews. <clears throat> God will draw the nations to Israel, and so will Satan. Both will have different reasons for doing this. Um, Zechariah 14 says, I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished. Half the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. For they are the spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to that day of the great day of God Almighty. 
Revelation 16. That's where they're gathering it all at Armageddon, or Megiddo. <clears throat> God requires that the church stand with Israel in this time. The church is brought to maturity and evaluated based on our responses to Jesus' leadership and standing with Israel. The litmus test of obedience will be standing with Israel in this hour. This will divide and purify us, the church. Many who profess faith in Jesus will fall away from faith at this time. Don't be surprised who falls away. Remember this. Do not be surprised who falls away. At the same time, many will be converted to Christ. In this, God will join Jews and Gentiles together in deep unity. I believe this. Ephesians 2 so as to create himself one new man from the two Jews and Gentiles, thus making peace. Jesus will suddenly bring deliverance and reverse all Israel's oppression as he kills her enemies. He's uh, killing our enemies too. Um, Jesus will restore Israel to the land with God's favor, making her the nation that leads all the nations of the earth. Israel's children will come from all the nations in which they are held captive. Jerusalem is the vortex of God's end time drama. Here's what it says in Acts 3, 17. My fellow Jews, I realize that neither you nor your leaders of Israel realize the grave mistake you've made. But in spite of what you've done, God has fulfilled what he foretold through the prophets long ago about the sufferings of his anointed one. <clears throat> and now you must repent and turn back to God so that your sins will be removed and so that the times of refreshing from the stream of the Lord's presence, he will send you Jesus, the Messiah, the chosen one for you. He, Jesus, must remain in heaven until the restoration of all things has taken place, fulfilling everything that God said a long ago through his holy prophets. The victor of the battle of Jerusalem will be worshipped and will govern the earth from there. All right, I want to move forward. And, um, oh, I let me just say right there, the Bible instructs us this way from Isaiah 40. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem. Cry out to her that her warfare is ended and that her iniquity is pardoned. We are to pray. And we're commanded to pray for her. We must shout it, declare it, decree it, sing it, so that all the nations of the Lord, of the earth hear. Um, God, in his mercy and justice, gives all na nations a witness of the coming conflict along with others, with an offer to participate with him in establishing his kingdom. Here's what Matthew 24 says. Thus says the Lord, sing with gladness for Jacob and shout. I don't think that's Matthew 24. Maybe it is. Okay, I'm sorry. For thus says the Lord, sing with gladness for Jacob and shout among the chiefs of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, to the, say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the ends of the earth. A great throng shall be there, for I am the father of Israel. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it often and say, that's what it is, Jeremiah. I didn't think it sounded like um, Matthew. He who scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. Here's what Genesis says. I will bless those who bless you, which is Abraham's. He was talking to Abraham. I will bless those who bless you, Abraham, and I will curse those who curse you. To, and then to Isaac and Jacob, he said, let the people serve you and the nations, the Gentiles bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be everyone who blesses you. That's Genesis 27. And again, in Numbers, blessed is he who blesses you. All right, so we are commanded, and it says it several times through the scripture. Now, I want there. Now, there's some more good information on what is happening right now in Israel. I want you to skip to the uh, the last page. I have page 60, so I believe it's 60. The Jewish people are being regathered. Jerusalem is being reoccupied by the Jewish people. Here are some signs. Here are some things that are happening. I've gone down at least halfway down the page. It says. Global prayer and worship movement is marked by enjoyable prayer, which is happening. We have enjoyable prayer again. Praise the Lord. Um, unsealing of revelation regarding the time of the end that will be available. More believers than ever are focusing their lives being ready for Jesus' return. Just as Jesus predicted, there would be ones who are ready. The remarkable progress of the Great Commission as it moves toward the Great Harvest. The Bible is being translated into every nation I, I, do, I forget the numbers, but it is, they believe they will be done by, 
I'm pretty positive 2030 they will be completely done, which actually is quite stunning that all that. Um, wars, rumors of wars. Oh, the market increase of, of wickedness. Um, the wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, earthquakes, scoffers, and mockers. All going to be happening. But you need to be aware that in the final days, the culture of society will become extremely fierce and difficult for the people of God. People will be self-centered lovers of themselves and obsessed with money. They will boast of great things as they strut around in their arrogant pride and mock all that is right. They will ignore their own families. They will be ungrateful and ungodly. This is from Second Peter. They will become addicted and hateful, malicious slanderers, slaves to their desires. They will be ferocious, belligerent, haters of what is good and right with brutal, with brutal treachery. They will act without restraint, bigoted and wrapped in clouds of their conceit. They will find their delight in the pleasures of this world more than the pleasures of loving God. They may pretend to have respect for God, but in reality, they want nothing to do with God's power. Stay away from people like these. For they are the ones who worm their way into the hearts of vulnerable women, spending the night with those who are captured by their lusts and steeped in sin. They are always learning, but never discover the revelation knowledge of truth. All right, my friends. Um, let's just, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. And Father, we're not going to end this class without blessing Israel. So right now, Father, you told us, you instructed us to bless Israel and to pray for the shalom of Yerushalayim. So right now we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, for the shalom of your people in Israel. Lord, we just thank you for the Messianic communities, and we pray right now that they will have strength to endure, that they will have wisdom and knowledge and revelation of how to go forward, how to move forward in the times that we are in, and that they will be able to maneuver through the circumstances that they have with the presence of the Lord. We pray for a backbone and a strength for the Jews right now, for the Messianics, Lord, we pray for wisdom, knowledge, and revelation. And I thank you, God, for the wise people, the wise ones who've gone there and who love the Lord and who are learning and teaching and uh, strengthening one another. Now, Lord, we pray also for America. And we see what's happening with the church turning away from Israel and this whole divestiture divest movement that's hit the church the schools hit everything even the the christian colleges i pray right now that this movement to run away from israel and to divest from uh israeli businesses i pray that this will be sent into chaos in jesus name we ask that good strong men and women will stand up for the truth and that they will bless abraham and they will bless israel in Jesus' name, we ask God for a move of your power in this land, in Israel, in Jerusalem, and in the United States of America. We ask in Jesus' holy name. Now, Lord, I pray for these, your people. I bless my friends. I bless this, Lord, in understanding your word and the times that we live in. I pray, God, that we will have wisdom beyond our own understanding that we will lean in everything that we do. We will lean heavily upon you and upon all, and we will acknowledge you in all of our ways, and you will guide and direct our paths. In Jesus' holy name, we give you all glory and all praise and all honor. All right, my friends, it's on my time thing. It was at 1.33.44. That's a good time to stop. So <laughs> may God bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. And we will meet once again uh, for our final uh, class. And it will be on the millennial reign, which will be the best class ever. <laughs> it's always my, my favorite. So I bless you and we will see you next week.